Welcome everybody uh, to another episode of the Recruiting Gym. Uh, this is where myself, Alex Moyle, founder of Nurture It, is focused on helping you build more money in the coming years. The webinars we have are focused on how to improve your sourcing, how to improve your ability as a manager, business development, all the topics to help you be successful. So today I'm super excited. Uh, we've got one of the world's best known recruitment trainers, Mike Wormsley with us. Uh, he's founded businesses, grown businesses, sold businesses, and today he spends his time as the founder of recruitmenttraining.com, but also runs a number of leadership uh, networking groups where every day he's spending time with recruitment business owners and recruitment consultants helping them grow. So without further ado, I just want to say, hi, Mike, how are you doing? Uh, I'm doing great, thanks. Uh, and it's a pleasure to be with you, Alex. I think what you're doing is great. I love the recruiting gym name. I think that's about right. There's so many people have gym memberships and, you know, six months in, they look at their bank statement and realize they should cancel that direct debit. And yet uh, one thing I've worked out in my life is the older I get, the more I realize I don't know. And I've already got a fair bit of knowledge in there. But I think uh, you, you want to try and develop and improve the whole time. So, you know, I love the concept. Yeah, and uh, I mean, it's great to have you on the show. And I, I learn a lot from the experts that we've, uh, that we've had on the show. Because actually, whilst a lot of recruitment hasn't changed over the last 15, 20 years, uh, how you apply that in today's market is often where the challenge lies. So uh, we've got some really positive uh, and, and anticipating uh, for this particular event. So, uh, so to remind everyone what we're covering today, it's about how do you grow your billings in 2018? And Mike's going to be answering a few questions for us. Firstly, how can experienced recruiters improve their gross margin by 25 to 50 grand per annum? Now, I don't know what your comp plan is, but I know those numbers would probably make a difference to what you earn this year. The second question that Mike's going to be answering for us is, what do successful recruiters have to do in today's market to win business? Back when I started in recruitment and Mike probably started, a lot of it was about smashing the phone picking up the phone locks. But in today's world, it's a lot more nuanced. It's not that the phone isn't important, but there's other routes to market. And Mike's going to be sharing his insights on that as well. And lastly, we're going to talk just briefly about how can candidates and the relationships you build candidates actually fuel your growth as a biller and move you more towards an environment where you work with clients that want to do business with you and are chasing you rather than you feeling like you're just slave to the to the cv machine or the uh, or the or the job portal so let's start with the first question so mike like what, what are your tips to help experienced uh, experienced recruiters grow in 2018 well the first thing in terms of the question of how can experienced recruiters add 25 to 50 thousand a year to their billings it's perfectly achievable that's the first thing so there's a mindset involved and you often get people who think things can't be done and that's as Henry Ford said, you know, whether you believe you're right or whether you believe you are wrong, you are right. So there's a kind of mindset of, you know, it either can't be done or it can be done. And I want to give you first -hand, a first-hand story, which I think will illustrate the tip I'm going to share with you. And that is a recruiter who um, I spent an hour with, and he was billing 300000 a year, uh, gross profit at the time. He's now billing $1.8 million. He's one of the biggest billers in the world. And it was one thing that he changed as a result of that one half hour, sorry, that one one hour meeting. Now, um, you know, without going into specifics about what it was, it wasn't groundbreaking or revolutionary. It was just something that I knew and he didn't. Uh, or, you know, I could point out to him um, and maybe he'd reawaken the old idea. So he then actioned that and that result over the next few years was extraordinary. And he now lives off that that particular technique that I shared with him. So what you're telling me, Mike, it's not about the ideas you're about to share, it's about how hard you work to put them into practice. Uh, well, there's certainly that, because there's so many people leave ideas on the table and don't implement them. He was one of the people that grabbed the idea, and then, you know, as I said, with that gym membership, he's the person going to the gym uh, every week, because he's doing it. He's at the coal face actually doing it. But the point I was really making was get a mentor. You know, once you reach a certain level of capability, um, where's your learning? You know, I, I said at the outset in, in, when we just chatted then, Alex, about the older I get, the more I realize I don't know. You know, how much does an experienced recruiter know right now in comparison to people who've been doing it for a lot longer than them, for example? Now, 
there's always things to learn and a mentor can help you with that. And that person could be within your own business or it could be an external person. I mean, I've had people who've you know, paid 500 pounds for one hour consultancy advice and they've done it out of their own pocket. That's a fair old investment for an individual to make out of their hard earned money upon which they've already paid tax. And by the way, I'm not touting for business. I'm just saying that there are some people who will, who will go out and find the guru, the, the person with knowledge. And quite often that person exists within their own company. So how do you go about, so say for example, I work in a, in a company, especially in larger companies, there's going to be top billers in different branches or different yeah. countries. How do you go about approaching that, that, that biller that you want to learn from, the mentor that you want, you want to sort of feel like you're going to gain some knowledge from? Yeah. Well, I'll tell you what I used to do. Um, I'd be a time thief. I call it be a time thief. Okay. You know, grab some, steal somebody's time. If I worked with you in your office right now, and I'm the big biller, for example, if I was, um, perhaps you should come up to me and say to me, Mike, can I buy you a quick drink after work? Yeah. Mike, can I buy you a coffee before work? I just want to pick your brains about how you operate. And yeah. other, ways, other ways you can do it, you know, if you have a culture where you, you go out as a team or you, you grab a coffee somewhere, just ask them questions from time to time, such as, what's the best thing you've ever done to source candidates? What's okay. the best thing you've ever done to win business? So some of it you can get that way within your own organization. Okay. Other ways are manage the manager. I'm, I'm a great fan of manage the manager. You know, people, sometimes reactive people wait for a manager to give them things. Okay. If proactive manages the manager. And what I mean by that is that, you know, that person's got the most control over their destiny than anyone else in the world. So what are they going to do about that? Go to the manager and say, you know, can we meet tomorrow for half an hour? Can we, can, can we uh, go for a sandwich at lunchtime? So some of it can be within your own business. Some of it, as I say, could be someone like yourself, Alex. Okay. You know, yeah. How do you go about approaching external mentors, so people that you can learn from outside the organization? And then I'm going to ask a question from Animal, who's, uh, who's watching. So what yeah. happens about finding those external mentors? As in, where do you find them? Yeah, I mean, I, I might, if I work for a small agency of maybe yeah. two, three, ten people, I might have a limited, I, I might be the top biller. Yeah. So how do I go about finding a mentor of someone that, that's maybe better than well, me? I think, I think in that situation where you're in a smaller company, you're reaching out to people and asking for help. You know, people have reached out to me. There was one guy I don't know, five or six years ago, and he's a really nice chap, actually. He just dropped me an email saying, my, my current company doesn't, do, doesn't offer any training. Can you help me? So it was a really pleasant email, so I replied to him. And um, he replied back saying, thank you, I haven't got the money. Basically, I gave him the, I gave him the video learning for free because of the way he asked. So okay. some of it is the appreciation that people will help you if you ask in the right way. Yeah. But for the person who's in that smaller business, they, they, they may not have that mentor apart from the MD, and they should reach out to the MD. But, okay. you know, I would um, go online, obviously, and look on LinkedIn and find somebody. I yeah. guarantee there'll be somebody out there who might help you for free or a small charge, and then you've got to, you know, decide yeah. whether that's worth it. And also, I think in today's world, that there's, I mean, you said go online. If you look at groups in Facebook, so you've got uh, animals, sort of recruiters online, recruiters that make placements, recruiting leaders. You know, personally, I go to Facebook now to, to get learning. And the great thing is about being part of a Facebook group is you can pose the questions that you don't know the answers to, and, and you'll be amazed at the size of response you get and the level of response you get to those problems and there's a group for everything there's a group for x-ray searching there's a group for general recruitment chat you know and it's finding a group where you feel that there's people that actually you learn from sure. uh, and and so facebook for me is the number one place to get questions answered if i want to be good at uh, a crm or i want to be good at people's email automation software i go and find a group that's good at that and people's ability and willingness to share their time is, 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 is massive now. Yeah. I think the key is having the emotional intelligence to ask the question in the right way and be pleasant about it. And you know, most recruiters have got that because that's why they're successful in the job in the first place. They can mediate and bring people together. But the, the next big tip I'd give, you know, is involves, um, again, going to the gym, really. And, and that is, um, if you think about in the next 12 months, can you as an individual improve in one skill per week and the answer is of course you can if you put your, your mind to that so the thing that i i used to do years ago when i ran parker bridge was to run short weekly training sessions and we did 30 minutes a week 
we put it in the DNA of the business. So I, in those days, it would be me with a flip chart of my brain. Um, and I'd, I'd, if the KPI underperformance on that week, say, was um, candidate referrals, this yeah. would be mini refresher training session for everybody, by the way, not just the people who feel they need it, would be candidate referrals. And you go away with one person making one action to make an improvement every week. If you do that 50 times in the year and you've got a team of five, you're going to get 250 improvements throughout the year if you stick to it. Now, that is a very simple, low-cost way um, to you know, get people talking, sharing ideas, yeah. um, coming up with better ways to do things, go on YouTube, find an Alex Moyle video, find a Mike, find a Mike Wormsley video, pop it on yeah. for 10 minutes, turn it off and discuss it. I mean, how simple is that? And the great thing is about that, Mike, is that you can leverage the knowledge of the experienced recruiters in the room. And, and what often the re experienced recruiters say is, well, I didn't learn anything new, but we talked about some things I used to do that I probably don't do today. Wow. I mean, my, my view on that is, is um, uh, I'll share it with you, because people often talk about refresher training. And, uh, you know, I, I've had people who've been on my courses three years after they went on it, you know, the, the same course. So I'm intrigued by that, and I see their face in the audience. I have a chat with them, and I say, oh, I mean, I'm intrigued. You know, you've come along to the same course three years on. What did you get from it? And, and this is what they normally say. I got loads from it, masses. I can't believe it. In fact, there's some things that, uh, you know, I'd forgotten about. It was a great refresher, Mike. <clears throat> and I'm thinking, hold on a minute. Their speech bubble is great refresher. My speech bubble is, why did you not have a plan of implementation the first time around? And why did you not hold yourself accountable to somebody to make sure you implemented the things that you wanted to implement? Because you've spent three years not doing the things that you wanted to do. Yeah. And and so, then, part, part of that, Mike, is often after a training course, you'll write down your action items. And I know some of the best learners that I know give those action items to their manager and they calendar invite three months time. Let's go through what I said I was going to do. Love it. Um, yeah. And it's using the managers. The manager's job is to remote. When you get experienced, your manager's job isn't necessarily to teach you things, but it's to hold you accountable for things that you know you need to do. Absolutely. And you mentioned managing your manager. Tell your manager to say, this is what I'm focusing on. Remind me. Uh, yeah. and, and, that, and I think that sort of mindset of growth and, 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 and call me out when I'm not doing it is, a, is, is key. Absolutely. Another big one is call recording analysis. You know, that... 20 years ago, when Steve Finkel, the American trader, wrote his book, Breakthrough, which is an excellent book, and he was talking about top performers listening to their calls, not just for what they're saying, but and then critiquing it and looking back on it and probably cringing, by the way, about some of the things they've said. Yeah. Which is a good thing, but also the tone of your voice. You know, were you too pushy? Were you not assertive enough or, or whatever it might be? And uh, call recording is a phenomenal free way if you've got an inbuilt VOIP system to you know, reflect on that. And you can almost coach yourself. So the mentor then is you. You're actually listening to that call and you're cringing thinking, ah, I could have closed in there. And when, I do, when I do video training, I don't need to say anything other than people watching themselves back on video. Yeah. Uh, so quick, we've got a few questions from the, from the group, Mike. So, so someone said to me is that why don't we have an implementation plan because, and it's because all they do is get managed by KPIs. So what would your advice be to someone that they go on training and come back and their manager just still talks about the KPIs? Well, I think um, managing training actions can become a micromanagement issue. Because if you've got five people on a training course and there's three actions each, there's 15 actions that the manager has to follow up on. I mean, I, I manage the... Um, implementation through automation within within my platform we've got some functionality that automatically reminds people of actions and that actually puts the accountability on the individual i'm more in the camp of the manager knows what the actions are um, the individual writes them down and actually they should type them up if you type your actions up and, 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 and you regurgitate the material you've just learned you remember more by default and you buy into it more and set yourself uh, you know put it put it on your smartphone I mean, I, I use Evernote, and it's a, it's a simple, free tool. Put it on your smartphone there and then. Um, and the next week, the manager should just say to you, how did you get on? So yeah. you don't necessarily need to have that reminder from the manager. It's more a case of, how did you get on? Okay. i would be more in that camp, really. So, so I'm conscious of time, Mike, and you, you drew us into this topic by telling us about the tip that you gave the guy that helps him go from 300K to 1.8 million. So... 
What was the tip you gave him that oh. he went away and, and executed? Crazily simple, but it was senior candidate tracking. And, uh, you know, think of all the warm calling techniques you can use versus cold calling techniques. And senior candidate tracking is one of them. So, i.e., you know, a senior candidate who's slightly outside your salary zone uh, calls you. Most people politely get rid of that person because they can't place them. <clears throat> and what he did was to qualify them and to talk to them and find out a bit more about them. And actually, they are also clients, as you might, you know, as you would know very well, Alex. You know, but saying to the candidate, come client. Um, so, Jimmy, one of the key things that employers look for in people at your level is the ability to build teams. Could you tell me about the teams you've built over the years, please, and how you went about doing that? Now, of course, that candidate is now going to tell you how, how, how often they recruit. So if you speak to 30, 40, 50 candidates over a period of time, you can now narrow, narrow it down to the senior candidates who recruit most often. And then very simple, you stay in touch and you build a relationship with and them. And where would you do that? Would you put those names in a spreadsheet? Would you put them in your CRM? How would you, would you put them in with your client list? What, what, how would you manage that technically within your day-to-day within your -day desk? Both. I mean, somebody asked me who my boss was once, and I said it was my calendar. Um, but my boss was my calendar, and I was very self-sufficient as an individual. I didn't really need managing. I just get on with it, really, because I'm very proactive by nature. So, uh, you know, through your calendar uh, and calendar entries. So every call, uh, you know, I would log on to the CRM, and it would be diarized, and it would pop up to remind me, you know, give this person a call. Um, it's as simple as that, really. Okay, that's, uh, that's good. And I, I remember one of my first directors said to me, he said, every client is a candidate, they just haven't given you their CV, and every candidate is a potential client, they just, some of them just don't have vacancies yet. And actually, I think a lot of recruiters, especially in today's world, look at the transaction that they're executing today rather than necessarily looking at that, that long-term relationship. More. So my, the, the chap I'm referring to who went to 1.8 million, um, he just called the candidates out of office hours, let them know how hard he was working on their behalf, because he was, he was still trying to find them things, and, and let them know that he's been selective. I mean, as an employer, what do you want? Okay, you want delivery, but how many candidates get messed around? And uh, how many candidates feel that the recruiter's not working hard and isn't selective? So he debunked that myth. He went for coffees with them, he went, took them to a football game, he played golf at the weekend with candidates. Yeah. And then one of them landed a job as a CTO of a FTSE 100 company, and the floodgates opened. And um, next thing you know, he took over on that account and then did others. Yeah. And that's all from being organized is organized and systematic about it. And, and, and evolving on that, I remember in the recession of 2001, two, three, I used to get loads of financial directors call me and go, could you help me get a job? And I would go, I can't help you get a job, but come in and see me and I'll tell you how to get a job. Yeah. Uh, and then what I would do is every time an advert came up in the Financial Times that they would be good for, I'd photocopy it because it was back in the day, yeah. put it in an envelope, send it. And, and whilst I didn't place any of those guys, two, three years down the line, they all took my call when they were recruiting. Sure. Uh, and, Smart move, yeah. And, and it's, just, it's just thinking a little bit longer term and making time for things that aren't going to maybe make you money today. Sure. Sending well, articles you, and that sort of stuff. If you just look at that discussion we've had there, Alex, and hopefully there's one or two people who've joined this session who've got a little idea they may, they may or may not be using. There's dozens of these things. There are dozens of little ideas and techniques. So the point is, you know, self-development should be a key element for everybody, me included. I mean, I, I self-develop. You know, I'm, I'm constantly learning. I'm looking at new things. I read books, audios. I go, to, go on courses. It, it should be in your DNA. And, and the arrogant person says there's nothing new to learn. Uh, the smart person is looking for the one thing they're not doing that they can implement. Great. Well, let's, that, that brings us into the first question. So the first question uh, that we were asked is, what can experienced recruiters do to increase their billings by 25 to 50,000 per annum? And, and Mike's top tip is really around develop yourself. Find a mentor, continually learn, whether it be internally or externally in your organization. We spoke about Facebook groups. I mentioned recruiters online, recruiters that actually make placements. The key is to ask questions that are very granular. And we've also had Mark pop up from Recruiters Arms says they do the they do the same as well. So so that's a that's the first question. And uh, so I'm excited about the next question. So the second question that we're going to ask Mike is, Mike, in today's market, what are successful recruiters doing to win more business? So. What are, the, what are the two or three top tips that you would give recruiters to win more business? Yeah, sure. 
Well, I want to set the scene by talking about my son. Um, he's, uh, when he was 13, he's 16 now. He was constantly on gadgets and kind of still is. And, and I jokingly called him Gadget Boy. And uh, he then uh, said to me, but you're Gadget Dad. And actually I am. You know, I'm, uh, I'm into all kinds of efficiencies and time savings. And there are some wonderful tools with, that you can integrate into LinkedIn that are not in, you know, common knowledge, really. To share, what, to share one with you today, take a look at Linked Helper. Linked Helper can automatically visit LinkedIn profiles uh, targeted. So you do a search in LinkedIn, candidate or client, um, in this instance, client, um, and you've got, say, 200 people there on, on, that, on that list. Your, link, your LinkedIn profile through Linked Helper, which is not part of LinkedIn, can auto visit those profiles. And some of them look back, and when they look back, you've now got a justifiable reason to connect. Thank you very much for looking at my LinkedIn profile, which they did. You stimulated and made it happen. And then next thing you know, you're engaging with that, that potential uh, prospect. Okay. can also do automated connections. So you can actually connect with 80 people, if you wish, at once. Dear John, dear Dave, dear Fred, and so on. And that can, you know, that's a powerful tool. So I'm, I'm, I'm big into technology and, you know, ways to make, save yourself time. But I'd say this, the number one thing I'd say is go and meet more clients. It's yeah. the number one thing. It's a relationship-based business. You know, find any opportunity to go and see customers and prospect customers. Now, when I do events, I'm doing a series of events commencing 30th of January in London. I do them 12 once a year. And um, one of those sessions is on business development meetings. And when I, whenever I do this session, I say, how many people have been on at least five business development meetings in the last month? A few hands go up. How many have been on 10? Of course, now there's less hands. 15, 20 fewer hands so you know depending on the geography and you know where you work and everything um you know when i was in the london market i went on 20 client meetings per month uh, and that's not as hard as it first sounds by the way you can easily fit that in i'm working with one company in the energy sector they only work international and they said how can we do all these meetings i said we'll do a video conference meeting you know don't call it a skype meeting or a zoom or a go to meeting call it a video conference and Alec, get a good three quarters of an hour or an hour from the client with a structured agenda. Yeah. And so you, it doesn't, it's an excuse to say, you know, I can't get to see my customers. Yeah. So if you go and see more customers, you make more money. And then, of course, the, the bit that's entwined with that is closing ability. And the key thing I see people not doing as recruiters, they're very, rarely, very few recruiters want to see a client when they're not recruiting. Whereas that was one of my favorites. Go and see them. If they recruit heavily, but they're not recruiting today, i.e. I've qualified to find out how often they recruit, then if they recruit, I don't know, 24 times a year and they're not recruiting now, statistically, they're going to recruit two people next month, so go and see them. Yeah. And at that meeting, close them to commit to deal with you exclusively when they're next hire, if you can pull that off. Right. So, so there's, that three, there's three cracking tips there. So we're just going to quickly loop back, Mike. So yeah. firstly, Linked Helper, you recommended to me and uh, it's a cracking tool, mm -hmm. uh, so which is great. The chat is going on about just be really careful with tools like Linked Helper because LinkedIn is cranking down on them. And it can oh, get totally you agree. Yeah. My, per my personal advice on Linked Helper is whilst Linked Helper will tell you that uh, that, that it set you some limits, I would use it very sparingly. I agree. Uh, I mean, and, you're having no more no more than eighty a day. Oh, Max. I mean, I set a limit of like fifty. You know, but yeah. just. Use it for specific jobs. So, for instance, and specific. So, for instance, I made a post where I had 250 people connect, mm -hmm. uh, like the post. I was able to send each of them personalized invitations. Yeah. It took me six days to do it. You know, so I'd say half an hour, 40 minute increments. Yeah. When you leave it and you set it running for the whole day, LinkedIn are going to. Oh, right. you'll, you'll get blacklisted if you do that. I agree. There's yeah. another tool called Duck Soup, D U X hyphen S O U P which does similar things to Linked Helper. And they'll pop up from time to time. And Contact Out is another one, which is a good email, uh, email scraping tool. So, uh, but, so, but so we, we, I want to move on to the client meetings a little yeah. bit. So, so, Mike, you said client meetings. I'm a massive believer in client meetings. I believe mm -hmm. video conferences are a tremendous tool if you work internationally. 
Uh, but how, what, if I'm a client and and I, I'm not recruiting at the moment, what would you say to me to make me feel that meeting you is worthwhile when I don't have a vacancy? So I'd say something like, and, and when I come down to see you, Alex, I'll share some ideas that will help inject cost and time savings into your hiring strategy. And I'll also share with you, if you wish, some ways in which we've helped businesses like yours to improve the way they attract better quality talent to their organization. Okay. And the thing is that if you've got an agenda point and it's help you save time and money in the hiring process yeah, and you know, help you enhance the way that you attract better quality talent to your company, <clears throat> those things are not seen as a sales pitch and they're not, you know, because and, and that having that agenda, it's like I'm actually giving something to the prospect customer rather than going down to sell to them. If they think you're going to go down and sell to them, they'll probably cancel the meeting. If it's beneficial for them, i.e. they're getting something that's useful, and they will, um, because you know, it's, the great thing about that approach I'm sharing is it takes you as the recruiter down the route of you must ask better questions on the meeting. You've got to find out the problems, the issues, the challenges. For example, Mr. or Mrs. Client, Typically, when you're interviewing, out of every, say, 10 people you interview, how many of them are not right for your position? Seven out of 10, my goodness, why is that? What are the typical reasons why they're not right? Personality fit, cultural fit, didn't have the right technical skills, and so on and so on. So you can draw out lots of problems, which is perfect for a solution-based salesperson. So what, you're, what you're telling me is that the pitch to the client isn't about is, is really about showing them what they're going to get from the time they spend with you rather than what you'll get. So they're going to get help and advice on uh, how to improve their hiring approach or improve their ability to... That's part of the reason, yeah. It's a long-term business relationship. And whilst I come down to see you, I'll share some ideas on X and Y. But the point is having those things on the agenda means that you, you control the agenda. You're not going down, down and doing a sales pitch. I mean, typically I break a meeting into four stages, gather information about the business, lots of questions, yeah. tell them the problems with the current recruiters without criticizing them. That's all about asking the right questions. Provide solutions to the problems and ask yeah. the client how they sound in comparison. They always sound better and then close them. So, so, so the animal, animals, we've got a question coming in from the recruiting animal and he said that he doesn't know what he could tell a client about recruiting except what a headhunter does. So, so he's basically saying, other than saying, you give me a job, I'll approach some people, and we'll, yeah. we'll, we'll, we'll keep in touch. What, what value does a recruiter have to give to a client? And help, let's help Animal out. Um, well, if you're looking at, the, as a business winner, because the question was about business development in particular yeah. in 2018, which is where I'm, I'm zoning in on, so we can, we can switch if we need to. Yeah. Um, for me, on that meeting, it's not me going down and, and, and selling to them. It's me x-raying where they are at the moment and asking the right questions. And, you know, typically you're finding out where, where there are cracks, where things have gone wrong. And I look at the interview process. So it was to start here, you know, who writes the job specification? Okay. Um, you know, uh, what happens next? Does the recruiter come and see you or not? How are you qualified as a recruiter to help with that? Because, I mean... Uh -huh. How are you qualified as a recruiter to help a client with that? that well, sort of if, if you've got the right processes in place, you can highlight to the client how those things are less likely to happen with you. But it's all about minimizing risk. I mean, the client can do it. The, the client, if the client had the resources and the skill internally, could do it themselves. And of course, some of them do. But you know, how do you how do you prove you can do it better than someone else? Well, you ask what the current people are doing. You ask what processes they've got in place, and you can then reduce the risk of that happening with you, and you can demonstrate tangibly that you, you've got superior processes to do things better. And also, I think it's worth bearing in mind, a lot of times recruiters don't appreciate what they do know and what they're good at. So they know how to write a good job advert. Mm -hmm. They know how to get someone in the interview room. Uh, they know how to manage expectations of salary and expectations through the process. They know how to promote an opportunity that, that to, in a way that gives people what they want. And not a lot of times recruiters go, well, that's just my job. Well, actually, but that won't make, that's what makes you a professional. And actually, especially in today's world, when you're meeting clients, they are often doing some internal recruitment themselves. Yeah, so, absolutely. Well, to answer, you know, is it recruiting animal who's talking? Yeah. That, you have the question. You know, one thing that I found useful in terms of um, selling retainers, for example, and, and, you know, if you're doing headhunting, you might be selling a retainer. I hope you are, by the way. 
because it's nice to get that money up front and yeah. uh, you know you've got better commitment from from the client but in my retainer um, discussion with the client if i'm going down that route i ask them a question um you know midway through and i say um oh mr or mrs client um when was the last time you were headhunted and they'll normally say whatever it is so um and let's say they've been headhunted in the last six months. And I say, well, you're still here, of course. So um, what did you say to that recruiter to make them go away? And invariably, they say, I told them that I'm happy where I am. And I then say to them, I said, that's interesting. How did they try to overcome your objection? And they say, well, it wasn't an objection. I'm happy where I am. Ah, interesting. We have a, a mantra in our business that the best people are the most resistant to change. And I would suggest that applies to you, Mrs. Client, because you stayed where you are. Uh, in fact, we are highly skilled at dealing with the objection, I'm happy where I am, or who gave you my name, or you know, I'm not interested in moving, and so on. And then I, I then put some realism on it and say, look, Mrs. Client, we don't always turn these things around. Let's face it, some, someone could be on an equity incentive. But we, we, in our business, suggest the real skill in today's market is seducing the candidate. And influencing the candidate to want to work for your business and we're very tenacious you know we understand we might catch the candidate at a bad moment their boss might be next to them so their knee-jerk reaction is i'm not happy sorry i'm happy where i am in which case the average headhunter goes away the really top quality headhunter comes back and they talk again and again in an outside office conversation and meet in a hotel maybe perhaps and next thing you know you're getting that golden candidate you wouldn't have got otherwise yeah i mean but i think but sometimes you can, and explaining what you do helps you to win the business. This is sort of like recruitment gold. This is if we could box this. This is uh, this is. And I guess there's loads of this on recruitmenttraining.com. But but what I love about this is that what internal recruitment teams will do, or level one recruiters will do, is ring up and go, "Hi, are you interested?" And if they say no, they jog on. What you're saying is that that actually you've got to like you've got to influence a candidate. But what I really like about what you're doing is you're selling to a client you're really articulating to a client how you do what you do differently from an internal recruiter or just an average contingent recruiter you know you're trying, to, you're trying to influence their mindset by explaining what you do mm -hmm. uh and help them see the difference because sometimes it's easy just to go well you give me a job i find some cvs and i send them over but you're you're breaking it down to specific situations and putting it into the mind of the client where they're actually able to go, yeah, I see how you might be able to do that differently, and and you're bringing them, you're bringing them with you, which I I absolutely love that that that, that role play. No, I'm really pleased. I think a lot of sales is educational, and you know by explaining what you do, and sometimes surprising them, asking that question, you know, when was the last time you were headhunted, um, and it draws, it draws them down that pathway, and then gets them to think, my goodness, the headhunter didn't do that with me. And therefore, I want this guy on my side. It also helps you to protect fees because yeah. when, once they understand the amount of work that goes into it, they're more likely to pay full fee. Yeah, and the key is, is explaining not what you do because what you do is more or less the same as every other recruiter. It's how you do what you do differently uh, in those little things. And you can have that same scenario about how you present candidates, that same scenario as to how you prepare them for interview, that same scenario as to how you debrief them. But it's, it's breaking down what you, what you do. Uh, we're over time, but I just want to—I just want to double back on the last thing that you said, which was the third key to success to to, to win more business is about your closing ability. Uh, and what I, what I like about that as a tip, Mike, is that that's really about asking the client for the business. Mm -hmm. you know, it's about saying, "I'd like to do business with you. What do I have to do to get an opportunity?" So, what 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 if I was to if I was a client again, because I think the role play worked really well this time. If I was like, well, Mike, I, mean, I speak to you. I speak to lots of other recruiters. So if I get anything, I might be in touch. What, what, would, your, what would your retort be to try and persuade me to use you than, than anyone else? I think the on a client meeting, it's already been set up, Alex. So it wouldn't really happen that way to the same extent. It might happen on, on, on a phone call, in which case you've got to establish a need. But during, ju during the client meeting, if you look at my structure, which is very simple, gather information about the business, step one. Yeah. Um, step two in the meeting is uncover issues and problems, which are invariably traceable back to the current suppliers. So questions like, out of every 10 people you interview, how many of them are not right for the position? That kind of thing. 
um, then um, at the right time, providing solutions to those problems and asking for the client's feedback. So if, um, if the problem is seven out of 10 people are not right for the role, and then I ask um, the client, so may I ask you, what measures have your current suppliers put into place to reduce the risk of these seven out of 10 not being right for your organization? And of course, if they already done that, it wouldn't be happening. So the, invariably the answer is either, I don't know or they haven't done anything. Brilliant, because now you can give a solution, whatever your solution might be. So um, you give your solution and then you ask something like, um, how does that sound? Or um, if I'd have been doing that for you, do you think you would have reduced the risk of those seven out of 10 people uh, being inappropriate on interview? And by the way, I don't, I don't mind a closed question if I'm going to get a yes or a no. I'm trying to, in that instance, I might be trying to flush that out. Ordinarily, they're dangerous, of course. But um, so I'm drawing down a pathway where I'm getting three or four agreements that my service at face value sounds superior to what they're currently getting. Yeah. At the end of it, I do a summary close. And the summary close is, okay, well, thanks for your time today, Mrs. Client. Let's now recap on what we've covered. We looked at seven out of 10 people being um, inappropriate for your business through the interview process, very costly and time consuming. And correct me if I'm wrong, you said that X and Y and Z that we do as a business, uh, you think that's going to reduce the risk of that happening. Good. We also looked at the, this issue of retention of people leaving your business after joining. And our solution to that was A and B and C. And, and again, please correct me if I'm wrong, but my understanding there is you feel that might help save time and money in your hiring process. And we looked at X and blah, blah, blah. Um, so on that basis, uh, how do you feel about working with me the next time you hire? And, and that's that's the key is a, a nice open open question there, Mike. Because I think what you're doing now is you're going to flush out some of those objections. My my, uh, my 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 last question was always just out of interest. When you next get an opportunity, what number call would I be? Because I wouldn't want to assume I'd be the first. Mm -hmm. And actually, if they go, I'd be, you'd be number two. You then know well what do I have to do to be the first? Or if it's and then sometimes I think. Recruiters just say, will you give me a chance? And they go, the client not yeah. wanting any conflict will just go, yeah. of course. And we go back and we go, it's amazing. My, my, my style was I went for the throat on that meeting. And my, my intention was you, you're either, as a client, you're going to call me exclusively with the next hire, or you're going to call me first, or you're going to call me alongside the current suppliers. So if I, you know, I try to get, you know, so I, my clothes would be, um, so bearing in mind what we've discussed today, how happy would you be to call me exclusively when you next hire? And if they say, oh, I can't really do that, and let's say I can't overcome that, I say, no problem, Mrs. Client, I understand. How about simply calling me first the next time you hire? Now, that feels like a drop down, in which case sometimes people will agree and I shake hands and take it. And if I can't get that, um, I say, well, in that case, how do you feel about calling me alongside your current suppliers the next time you hire? And really, if you do a solution-based sales meeting, it's, it's apart from big PSLs, which require several meetings and a tender process or something, it's nigh on impossible not to close for one of those three things. Yeah. That's my view. No, I, I, I agree, Mark. And I think what, 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 what underwrites a lot of the advice you're giving to sort of how do you get, grow and, and succeed in today's market is that you've got to work at selling. You know, and selling isn't isn't making people buy things they don't want. It's good selling. It's do you understand the need? Do I show how the features of my service or how I work gives them solutions to those problems? And then asking them whether what you've described shows how what you can do is better than what they have at the moment. And, and I think, you know, to sum it all up, remember recruitment's a contact sport. You know, you've got to be out there meeting customers, talking to them. Now, that's not old fashioned. It's bang up today in today's world. Tools like Linked Helper and DuckSuit will come and go and new things will come along. And we'll all look for technologies to help us. But you're absolutely on the money there, Alex. It's about sales. It's not, what do you call that now? Salesmanship is gone, that word, isn't it? I don't know what the word is. In, well, you can't, that, I mean, you can't it's make about sure being, it's about being a great. It makes you a bad person, really, because obviously sales is about forcing people to do things that you don't want to do if you believe the narrative. Uh, on social media, but but I'm a believer, and and it seems you're a believer that selling can be good and done well and in a consensual way with with clients. Oh, for definite, ninety five percent of salespeople, in my opinion, get it wrong. They're pushy, they're devious, they lie to people. Perhaps some of them, anyway, down the bottom end of that percentage. The best five percent help their customers to provide solutions to problems. That's it. Great. Well, I. Uh... 
Well, I mean, I, I, my, this is, I've just loved every minute of, of this. We're not going to get to the third question, which is, which is disappointing, but I'm, I, we are on a, are on a clock. So what, what I would say is that just give us 30 seconds quickly on recruitmenttraining.com as to why everyone should check it out. Uh, cause you've, you shared some brilliant stuff today. So give, give, give us a quick pitch about recruitment. Yeah, thank you. And you know, I'd love to do it again sometime, Alex, if there's no time today, we can look at other things some other time, but the, uh, recruitmenttraining.com, um, I've completely revamped it. All the old material materials being refilmed. We've got 150 hours of video material for recruiters, managers, and directors. And there is some real gold in there. People who've met Steve Jobs, Nelson Mandela, sharing their stories at director level as to how you can adapt that thinking into your business and then mainstream recruiter techniques. But the main thing is with the new model I've built is you can white label it and you can add your own content because some of my content today, you know, hopefully it's useful for you and gets you thinking, but it may not be on the money for you and you have to edit that and tailor it. And I think in today's world, it's about the best you can get. You don't need a single expert. You need, you know, the best advice from multiple sources. And that sometimes is in your own business. So, Anyone who subscribes to our platform can put their own content in and put it in their own colours. That's terrific, Mike. Well, I mean, I think you've you've given a great advert today for the content that you've already got. Uh, a pitch for Nurture It. Uh, last week, we launched our YouTube channel, uh, nurtureit.io, uh, on YouTube, and we've got 35 recruitment videos. This is where we will place the repeat of Nurture It and this session. Uh, if you're looking to grow this year and you think being more organized will help you with that, then what I'd really encourage you to do is check out nurtureit.io. Uh, it's a terrific place for you to organize your pipeline, your leads, your vacancies and your placements. Uh, but at the very least, sign up to the blog so we can let you know about future webinars. So, but thank again, Mike, for your contribution. I've really enjoyed it. And we're getting some great preps from the, uh, from the chat room as well. So, Thanks a lot, Mike, and I'm sure we'll uh, we'll hear from you again soon. My pleasure, Alex. All the best. Thanks a lot. Bye.